Um, before I get into the message, I just wanted to share something. The thing that God's put on my heart to share with you guys today, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10, so you can open your Bibles up to there if you want. Um, but I want to kind of just explain a little bit about what, um, about the message. And you guys can turn the video off if you like. Um, so here's the, here's what God has been putting on my heart. Um, Obviously, it's, it's not news to you guys that we, we suffer, we go through trials, we go through a lot of difficult things in life. That's not news. But um, a lot of times I'll listen to pastors from the United States, I'll be listening to what, what, what's being said, especially to the pastors that are super popular, that a lot of people are listening to. And here's what I've been finding. I've been finding that they're you know, they're preaching about the suffering and stuff, and they're preaching about how God has solutions. He has healings. He, he, he can enable us to overcome and to get through these trials. And, and the preaching stops there. And there's something missing. It's a huge part that's missing. And, and that's what's been on my heart. Yes, we go through huge trials. There's no question, obviously. And life is extremely difficult. And God does have purposes for it. And he is sanctifying us through these things. And, and he is using them to, to glorify himself and to draw him. But, but there's another part to it all too. God has brought us together as the church so that we can help each other get through those times. So that we can remind each other when we forget how good God is, how faithful he is, how powerful he is. But we don't stop there. We are supposed to be used by God to impact the world. And we're the only ones that can do it. When we talk about the gospel, this is God's solution. And I know it sounds you know, very simplistic, and, but, but the gospel is God's power at work to save everybody that believes. That's what Romans 1.16 says. The, God, the gospel is God's power at work to save everybody that believes, for the Jew first and then the, the Greek. And so this solution, we, we're the only ones that can give it, the church, Nobody else can do that. The government can't do that. Hospitals can't. No, it's the church that can do that. And so I've just, it's been a huge thing on my heart to, to, to not just say, okay, God's going to minister to us in our trials and he's going to use each other within the body to get through the trial, but then he's going to use it to glorify himself. How? By us going out into the world and sharing the gospel with people. That's how. Yes, we're going to do it through ministry. We're going to feed. We're going to bless the orphan and the widow. Of course, we're going to do that. But the first and foremost thing is to share the gospel. It's always got to be first. It's always got to be the foremost thing. So that's the thing that's been on my heart that's stirring me up for this message. And so um, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this church. I thank you for the church. Thank you for, God, what you've done for us, that we can be the church. I thank you, God, for the sacrifice that you made for each one of us so that we could be forgiven, that we could draw near to you, that we could be justified, we could be just holy in your sight because of the blood of Christ. And so, Lord, as we open your word, I pray for that you, God, would speak to each one of us, that you would minister to us, and you would um, just take this word and put it right in exactly where it needs to be in each one of our lives because you know each one of us perfectly, you know exactly what each one of us are going through, and only you can minister to us in, in this perfect way. So, Lord, I pray that you would please do that. And we pray this for your glory, God, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Hebrews chapter 10, there's, there's two main points that I want to share. The first one, it has to do with unwavering faith. And God's expectation is that we don't doubt him. God's expectation is that we don't doubt his goodness, we don't doubt his faithfulness, we don't doubt his power. That's the expectation, unwavering faith. And that's the first thing I want to talk about. The second thing I want to talk about is how God uses trials, and those trials are often the thing that are going to cause us to want to doubt God. But he uses those trials to glorify himself, and he uses those trials to further his kingdom as well. So those are the two things that I want to, to focus on, and we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10. Now, just a little background before we get into it. The author has been encouraging these 
believing Jews to hold fast to their faith because encouragement was necessary. They were, they were going through difficulties. They were suffering. They were going through trials. They were going through persecution. There was division. There were problems in the church. Imagine that, problems in the church. Can you believe it? They were facing all these different things. And, and up to this point, the author has been pointing them to Jesus. He's been calling them to focus their attention on Jesus. And he's been showing, the author's been showing up through Hebrews how Jesus is superior to everything else. He's superior to the sacrificial system. He's superior to the old way of doing things. He's superior to everything. That's, that's like the big theme for Hebrews. Christ is superior and so he's been calling them to focus on Jesus through their, through their persecution. But then he's also been calling them to be the church. And what does that mean, be the church? It doesn't mean well, we just come together and we sit and we worship and we hear a message and we go about our lives. No, to be the church in the world, to be an, uh, an impacting force that, that God wants to use to change people's lives. This is, this is relevant to us because... Like the Hebrews, like the, the Jewish believers here that, that the, the author was addressing, we live in a hostile culture, hostile to true Christians. Our culture is hostile to true Christians, and it's getting more and more hostile. And some people are like, what is happening? Why is this, you know, why the hostility? And, you know, we've, we've kind of been enjoying in the United States for quite a long time some relative peace in, in terms of towards the church. Well, guys, this isn't a normal thing, honestly. And if you look through history and you look through um, the church history, especially, the church isn't normally welcomed within cultures. They've been set apart and they're different and, and the devil will use all different kinds of things to make sure that the cultures are hostile towards them. Well, our culture is hostile towards us and it's growing more hostile but listen to what Jesus said in John 15. You don't have to turn there, but listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hates you. If you were of the world, the world would love you. That's a really important thing to think about. Because I know my desire is not to be hated by the culture. I don't like that. Nobody does. I don't think, unless you're just really weird. <clears throat> I don't want to be hated by the culture. But Jesus said, the world is going to hate you. He says, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now, how do, you, how do a lot of Christians get around this? They compromise in their faith. And they say, well, you know, we, we can take some of these things and it's okay, but a lot of these things we're not going to hold on to because the culture doesn't like it. So we're going to compromise. That way, the world's not going to hate me so much. Well, that's compromise, and the world is going to hate us. Now, the cool thing is, how do we respond as Christians? We hate them back even worse, and we, you know, we, no, the opposite. We love them. That's how. So we respond to hostility with love. We respond to hostility within a culture with, I'll lay down my life for you. That's, that's an amazing thing, because, I mean, think about the, the different religions out there that are saying, you follow this religion or else I'm going to kill you. We're saying, I hope that you hear this gospel and I'm willing to lay my life down for you in order for you to hear it. That's how much I love you. In the face of hostility, um, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, all who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. It's going to happen. So not only are we going to be persecuted by our faith, but as you all know, we're going to suffer we're going to suffer trials. We're going to suffer tribulations. We're going to suffer times where our faith is going to be just rocked. And life is really, really difficult. And what's going to happen often is we're going to be tempted to doubt God. We're, we're going to encounter a massive trial and we're going to start wondering to ourselves, or we're going to be tempted to start wondering to themselves, is God really good? Because this thing is not good. And we're going to be asking questions like, is God really faithful? Because this promise says this, but this has happened. And is he, is he really faithful? And we're going to be tempted to say, 
is God really powerful because this thing has happened and is, is he really powerful? That's, those are real temptations. Those are real temptations. And as you guys, I'm sure, know, the temptation itself is not the sin. It's what you do with that temptation next. There's a fourth option that people often um, will try to go to. It's not a valid option, but there's, there's the fourth option. The fourth option is when you encounter a massive trial is to say, I don't believe in God. I don't believe he exists. Because this thing happened, that thing happened, God must not be real. It's not a valid option, and let me tell you why. In Romans chapter 1, Paul explains how God has revealed himself to everybody, to all mankind, in such a way that nobody on earth ever has or ever will be able to say, God, there's, well, they wouldn't say God, but first, they would just say, there's no evidence that God's real. There's no evidence that God exists. I know people say this, but I'm, I'm, I'm refuting this with scripture. Paul said, there's nobody that will have an excuse. Nobody can say there is no God. I know they can say it physically, but there's no way to say it with truth. The fact is, is that people who say they don't believe in the existence of God, according to the Bible, it says they have suppressed the truth. Romans 1.19, it says, because... They've suppressed the truth because what may be known of God, it's manifest in them for God has shown it to them. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they're without excuse. What's all that saying? It's saying that God has given us creation. There's the earth, there's the moon, there's the sun, there's the stars. And all of these things declare God's glory. They declare his power. I know people say, no, 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 I don't believe it. I, I don't believe it. I, and they have to like totally cover every sense that they have in order to say that. For you to say there is no God, and I know it, like for a, a true atheist is actually, it's one of the most ridiculous stances you can have. Here's why. For you to say, I know for a fact there's no God, and, and I'm sure you guys have heard this kind of thing before, but, but for a f- person who's really an atheist to say, there's no such thing as God, I know it for 100% fact, In order for you to say that, you have to know 100% of everything there is to know. Everything in the universe, you have to know. So if you took all the information in the universe, and we call that 100%, I mean everything there is to know. You have to know all of that in order to say, I know for a fact there's no God. It's really easy to take a person from being an atheist to just saying, well, I guess I just don't know then. Get off my back. It's really easy to get them to move from there because atheism is an extreme stance, and it's not... Tenable. You can't stand there. Because you're saying, as Ravi Zacharias said, and I, I hope I get this right. He said, you're saying that I am an all-knowing being who knows that there is no such thing as an all-knowing being. Does that make sense? <laughs> I know everything there is to know, the entire universe. Dude, you don't even know what's in the ocean. Like, you know... Not even in your own little earth here, let alone the entire universe, but you know for a fact there's no God. It's ridiculous. Moving on. That fourth option when tragedy strikes, it's not a valid option. It's erroneous. It's it's invalid. It's irrational. It's really easy to move a person from being an atheist to just saying, I just, okay, I don't know, okay? Psalm 119 is beautiful. Listen to what it says. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or a word. Their voice is never heard. Yet, their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. God's creation declares who he is. I don't have to convince anybody that there's God. Everybody knows it, but they have suppressed the truth. Those people that say, no, there is no such thing as God. So these other forms of doubt, though, these other options about doubting God's goodness, his faithfulness, his power, they're so common, even among the church. And and oftentimes we'll look around the church and we'll say, well, everybody does it. So what's the problem? I mean, I'm sure God doesn't like it and everything, but but since everybody does it, it must kind of be okay for us to doubt him. And so we kind of think like, you know, we get a pass for doubting God. We kind of think that, okay, because this is a big, huge trial, this is a serious problem, 
God is going to understand if I doubt his goodness in this moment. He's going to understand if I doubt his faithfulness or if I doubt his power. And we kind of try to give ourselves a pass. And the fact is, we don't get a pass. And, and honestly, as a church, we need each other to... We can't give each other passes either. I'm not saying we're going to stand there and you stop doubting. What's the matter with you? And we can't do that. And by the way, I, I've shared on this topic a number of times before, and I've had people come up to me and say, look, I know you're not... Come, I know you're not like a, thinking that you're some kind of spiritual giant or anything, but you come across as though, you know, you don't struggle with this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, man, it's the opposite. I struggle with this hugely. That's why it's such a burden on my heart to share. No, I, I, as soon as a trial hits, and it doesn't even have to be a big trial, immediately I turn into a little toddler and I'm like, yeah, why God? And this isn't good. And, and um, I need the church to come in alongside me and say, okay, Kyle, God is good. Don't forget, man, God is good. He's faithful. He's, and I need that reminder. And, I'm, and immediately I'm like, yes, I know. I'm sorry. That was stupid. What I don't need is for somebody to come along and say, you know what, dude, I do the exact same thing. I throw a temper tantrum too, but I get on the floor and I stomp and do this. It's okay. Don't worry about it. That's what I don't need. That's what none of us need. In fact, that's terrible counsel. And you may be guilty of giving that counsel. I'm not coming down hard on you. I'm just saying, don't do that anymore, please. And I'm going to show you why. I'm going to show you through scripture why that's not okay and why we have to stop doing it. So don't take this as though I am the spiritual giant saying, you better stop doubting God because I do it all the time. I'm saying we have to stop doing it. God's put this burden on my heart to make sure that we stop doing it as as the body of Christ because it doesn't honor him. And he's not okay with it. So God's equipped us. So the, the, the negative sense is we can't do it, okay? That's the negative sense. The positive sense is God's equipped us so that we don't do it. He's equipped us with these three massive tools to combat temptation, to doubt, so that we can endure the trial, so that we can get through the trial, but not stop there. Don't forget it's not just to get you through the trial. It's so that God can be glorified. And, and how is he glorified? Is by using us to impact the world. So we don't stop there just by getting over the trial. No, we, we continue and, we, and we're used by God. And I think that's a huge part to all this. And I think that the message that's going to the church that I hear a lot from a lot of the popular preachers, they stop with you getting over the trial. And, and that really messes up because God wants to use you to impact the world, to go and share the gospel and to go and do these amazing things. And, and when you only stop here, you know, you become really self-centered and you think it's all about you. I do that a lot. I think it's all about me and it's not. It's all about him. It's all about his kingdom. So there's these three huge tools that God's given us in order to fight this temptation to doubt him. And those tools are this. He's given us himself, the Holy Spirit. He indwells us. That should be enough, but that there's more. He's given us more. He's given us his word. And he's also given us the church, us. Those are massive tools. He's given us himself. He's given us his word. And he's given us us, the church, in order to fight the temptation to doubt him. Let's look at Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. Would you guys read this with me? Verse 19 of Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to read through verse 25. It says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. He's saying, 
in light of the fact that we have this new approach to God, remember, the author of Hebrews is talking to Jewish believers, and Jewish believers had a system of approaching God, and it was very different to the way we approach God today. We get to draw near to God on the basis of his grace through our faith, and it's because of the blood of Christ. It's because of the finished work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. He paved the way so that we can draw near to God. This is the new living way that the author's talking about. And by the way, this is the key to it all. This is where it all has to start. In, our, in the ministry that we're doing, that God has us doing, on Thursday night, we're, we're on the street and we're, we're, we're ministering to these people who are going through some unbelievable stuff in their lives. I mean, imagine how difficult your life would have to be in order for you to put yourself in the worst city, well, in the worst street at the worst time of night to sell your body every single night. Imagine the, you know, the place you would have to be and how, how messed up your life would have to be in order to, for you to be on that street corner. These people are dealing with massive problems, all kinds of abuse, all kinds of addictions, all kinds of trials, all kinds of stuff in order for them to be there. Well, we come to them and we're like, my gosh, you're such a mess. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? I mean, seriously, where do, I, where do you start? Your life is, oh my gosh, I don't even know how to begin. And, and we always have to remember there's, there's one place to begin. It's always the same. It's always the same. There's one crucial thing and only one. This makes things much easier because I'm a simple person and God has, has given us a simple message to share. And, and it's the gospel. That's the priority. It's not, wow, your parents did what to you? Okay, let's deal with that. No, it's not the addiction. It's not the this. It's not the that. It's the gospel. It's Christ. That's the place to start. There's no other place to start. It never will be. There never can be. A lot of ministries that do what we do, they, they turn in, they started good with the gospel, and then they turn into a rescue service where they're just trying to help people get off the streets, help people with addictions, help people with all that stuff, and they forgot the gospel. And honestly, that stuff is useless. I know it seems good. Like they got them off the street. Praise God. Uh, that's not the solution, though. And that's not the place to start. It's the gospel. That's where we have to start. That's the, that's the critical place. And in the Old Testament, so one of the things that the author of Hebrews is doing, he's dealing with people who are used to an old way of approaching God. In the Old Testament, the old system, so to speak, the way that they approached God was once a year, the high priest would have to do a bunch of rituals. He would have to bathe in a certain way. He would have to put on certain garments. And then once a year, he could enter and he could draw near to God and he better have done all that stuff right. Man, he better have the things all done right and not have any sin in him and, and he had done the sacrifices right and he put the bathing, he did bathed properly and all that stuff. Otherwise, he draws near to God and he's getting close to the Holy of Holy and if something's wrong, man, he's dead right then and there. Boom, that's it for you. That was the way of drawing close to God. Imagine, that was all you had in those days where once a year we could draw near to God, that day of atonement. Once a year, that one high priest would be able to draw near to God after all that preparation. But here in verse 19, the author is saying, we can approach God boldly, each and every single one of us. We can go right to where he is, so to speak. It's not that God is in this particular location, but we can go right to where he is, so to speak. We don't wait once a year. We don't have to go through all these rituals. Why can we do this? Because of the blood of Christ. That's why. So without the blood of Christ, it doesn't matter, honestly, what obstacles you overcome. It doesn't matter, honestly, how well you, know, you get through the trials in your life. Then That stuff, honestly, it doesn't matter. Without Christ... All of that stuff is wasted. Why? Because you're still separated from him. You're still dead in your sins. And you're, you're separated from God. You're unreconciled. So that's why when we're talking to people that, man, are literally like 
on death's door, so to speak. There's one example I want to share with you real quick. After church one day in the park, um, well, during church, during church, I usually have people, especially drunk people, they will see that I'm standing there in the middle of the amphitheater and there's a crowd of people listening to me. And, and so the drunk people, they want that attention. So they'll jump in front of me and be like, ah, look at me instead. <laughs> and so I have to deal with that every week. It's normal. And so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll be like, sit down. And I'll be kind of serious. I'm like, I'm preaching the gospel. Sit down right now. And, and, and if they don't listen to me, I'll kind of get them in a little headlock. And they're, I'm quite a bit bigger than most of them in the northern Brazil. And so I can kind of hold them here. And they're like, eh. And I'm like, you're going to sit down and be quiet, right? Oh, OK, OK. And they'll sit down. Well, <laughs> um, so uh, these three women, well, two actual women, one was a transvestite, they walked by me and they start kind of, they were starting kind of uh, mocking me as, a, as I was preaching, which is, it's, you know, it's not really that common, honestly. If we did this ministry in the United States, I think I'd have eggs thrown and tomatoes and we'd be mocked all the time. In Brazil, it's not the case. I don't get mocked that much. I deal with drunks and I deal with marching bands and stuff like that, but not, <laughs> not so much mocking. But these three went by mocking and I just looked at him and I continued to preach the gospel and I kind of stared at him like, I'm not afraid. You're not going to, you know, wreck this because you're going to, you know, mock me. And so it kind of threw them a little bit. And so they sat down and they listened to the whole message. And then afterwards, they were kind of mingling around where I was. And I, and I got this sense that they wanted to talk, but they were afraid to come talk to me because they were, you know, they're, they're on the streets and they're in bad shape, all three of them. And so I got the sense that they didn't want to come approach me because I'd be like, ew, get away from me or something like that, which they're kind of used to. And so I see him and I'm like, come on, let's talk. And so they were really like excited to talk. So I got to sit there for like a, it was at least a half an hour. And I was just talking to them more about the gospel, explaining to them. And these, these people were in bad shape. I mean, bad shape. One of the women, she didn't have any teeth. She's covered in scars. I don't know what these scars are from, if they're knife fights or what they're, but they're massive scars all over her body, her face, everywhere. She has no teeth. She's living on the streets. She's in bad shape. And after I'm done explaining the gospel, I'm like, you understand the gospel, right? So you understand how to be saved, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. What's going to happen tomorrow if you die? Two of them said, I don't know. One of them said, I'm going to go straight to hell. And I'm like, okay, well, at least one of you understands what I've been saying to you. Now, let me explain it again to the two of you that said you don't know, because I don't know is not an answer. No. There's a very clear yes or no. You're either going to go to hell or you're going to go to heaven. That's, I don't have to wonder about it. And so I explained it again to him. And I asked that one woman with the scars all over her, I asked her. And it was a real interesting thing. God was doing this. And I, I'm not usually this like forward people in like this demanding of, you better make a decision right now. Like, you can't really do that to people. But in that particular moment, that's what God was having me do. I wasn't being rude about it. I was like, listen, you know the gospel. What are you going to do? Because right now and right here, you can turn from that life that you're living and you can believe in the gospel. And, and literally what I've been telling you is true and you'll be saved and your sins will be forgiven. Will you do that right now? And she's like, no. And I'm like, wow. Okay, well, you know what's going to happen to you? And she's like, yeah, I'm going to die. I'm going to go to hell. You guys, I'm not joking about this. A couple weeks later, we're on the street Thursday night, and I run into the, one of the, the transvestites. He's a young kid. He's, he called himself Stephanie, but after I talked to him for a couple minutes, I, I was like, what's your name? He's like, it's Lucas. First, he's like, it's Stephanie, and then he's like, it's Lucas. I'm like, okay. And Lucas was there on the street. He's a prostitute. And he's like, I remember you. And I'm like, yeah, I remember you. And he tells us, you know that woman you were talking to? And I'm like, the one with scars with no teeth? She's like, yeah, she's dead. And I'm like, what? I was kind of shocked, and, and I'm so thankful. And it was totally God in that moment, just like using me to really just put her in the spot because, you know, God knew what was going to happen. I don't know what happened to her. God knows. I know that she has no excuse to stand before God. And it could very well be that, you know, the moment before she died, she gave her life to Christ. I don't know. I pray that she did. 
That's the, that's the situation that we're in. I don't have to deal with the fact that she's living on the streets right away. I don't have to deal with the fact that she's addicted to drugs and she's a prostitute. What I have to do is make sure she understands the gospel. That's it. I'm not, that's not it. Like, I don't, <laughs> bye. Have fun now with your addictions. No. I don't, we don't do that. We're trying to minister to their needs as well. Absolutely, we are. But the main thing is the gospel. Because without that, without that forgiveness, you're dead in your sins. And that's the, that's the worst place you could be, worse than prostituting yourself on the street in Berlin. That's the worst place you could be. You're under God's wrath. And people hear that and they're like, wait a minute. It's true. When we're unreconciled from God, we're under his wrath. Does that mean God doesn't love us? Of course it doesn't mean that. Look, the gospel is a demonstration of how much he loves us. Even when we're under his wrath. How? I don't know. I, that doesn't make sense to me how he does it, but that's the way it is. And what's amazing, it's by faith. It's, it's by believing in this gospel that I can be reconciled to him. Not by anything else. Nothing else. There's not, it's not possible to do it any other way. So what he's saying here in this section of scripture is we can boldly draw near to God, and he says, with full assurance. Listen, if my relationship, I'm talking personally, if my relationship with God was based on my works, then I would never have full assurance. I would every time be why, trying to draw near to God, please don't strike me down because I know I'm all messed up. I know my thoughts. I know all this stuff. If, if the assurance was based on me, I'm in big trouble. I do not have the ability to draw near to God based on my works. And so he says, with full assurance, why? Because of the work that Christ did for me. So that's my full assurance. I get to boldly draw near to God with full assurance because I'm pointing at what Christ did for me, not anything I did for, for me. That's where I get my full assurance. So he's saying in light of this gospel, in light of the fact that your sins are being forgiven, in light of the fact that we're reconciled by the blood of Christ, he's saying, let us draw near to God. Because you've been reconciled. You've been cleansed. I know that a lot of times we don't want to draw near to God because we look at ourselves. We know our mind. We know what we've done. We know what we're thinking. We know all this stuff. And so we just don't want to go near to God. But, but you're, you're looking at the wrong place. You, you look to the blood of Christ, what he's done for you, and then we can draw near to God because that's where you need to be. We need to be near to God. And then he says this, in light of all that stuff, let's do What? Let's hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. So this is the expectation, unwavering faith. That's a huge expectation. It's extremely high. But look at the tools we have. We have the Holy Spirit, God living in us. We have his word, his living word. And we have the church. We have each other. God's expectation is unwavering faith. You don't get to doubt. We don't get to doubt. And these are the tools that he's given us. And here's a th something that we need to understand. God, he will design trials in your life in order for him to be glorified and then for you to be sanctified. So God will design trials, design, purpose. He'll design trials in your life so that he gets the glory and so that you get sanctified. Yes, he will do that. And yes, that is the correct order. His glory first, and then us. Uh, there's, there's a couple examples that I'm going to show you so that you, you know it's not just me saying that. This is God's word. We know that the, the expectation is unwavering faith. And we know that when we look around at the church, we see people wavering all the time, don't we? We look at each other and we say, "Why well, you're wavering, you're doubting, you're, you're not, uh, you know, holding in this unwavering faith, so I guess it's okay. Well, it's not okay. Let me show you. You don't have to turn there, but let me just give you the examples. You can trust me and you can read them later. Matthew chapter 8, the disciples, they thought they were facing certain death. Why? Because their boat was sinking in the storm in the middle of the sea. These were fishermen. These were guys that were used to the sea. It's not like, you know, they didn't know what was really going on. 
They knew what was happening and they knew the situation was extremely dire and they were gonna die because of the situation. And Jesus was on the boat with them and he's asleep. Now, the thing is that Jesus had already commanded that the disciples go to the other side of the sea. He had already given that command. And if Jesus commands something, it's gonna happen. If the command is there, then then it's gonna happen. So they cry out to Jesus to save them. You guys probably know the story. Jesus said to them, why are you afraid, you of little faith? Now, in in Matthew's gospel, there's something interesting because Matthew gives us the timing. The other two, Mark and Luke, they don't explain to it, when did Jesus say, why are you afraid, you of little faith? But in Matthew's gospel, it says, first, they wake him up and, and they're like, Jesus, we're dying. Don't you care what? Are you going to do something or are you going to sit there and sleep? And Jesus, it says, the next thing that happened is Jesus said, why are you afraid? You have little faith. In Matthew's gospel, it seems to me that Jesus says this while the storm is still happening and while the ship is sinking. So can you imagine you're on the boat and we're all about to die and Jesus wakes up from his nap and is like, why are you afraid? And you're like, are you kidding me? What? <laughs> Look around. Why am I afraid? But, but that's how Matthew's gospel puts it. Jesus said, why are you afraid? And then he stopped the storm. It says in Matthew's gospel, you can look at it. Then he stopped the storm. He said, why are you afraid? And, and we would just be like, are you kidding me? Why? In, in Matthew chapter 14, one of my favorite things, one of my favorite um, stories, Jesus is walking on the water Everyone's terrified. And Peter says, Lord, if it's you, call me out on the water. And Jesus says, come. That was a command. He said, come. Now, Jesus didn't get up to the boat and say, hey, get out of the boat and come to me. No, Peter said, hey, I want to go. Can I go? And Jesus said, come. That's a command. It was in response to what Peter wanted, but it's still a command. So Peter gets out of the boat. He's walking. He obeys the command. But then Peter doubts, and then Peter sinks. And Jesus says to Peter, you of little faith, why did you doubt? To me, those two examples are the perfect examples of where we should get a pass to doubt. Those should be the times where Jesus is like, oh, I was just messing with you guys. Of course you're going to doubt. I mean, you guys were going to die. Of course everybody's going to doubt. And Peter, he's walking on water. Everything is impossible. There's a storm and he sinks, and you would think that Jesus was like, ah, that was so funny. You should have seen your face, Peter. You were so scared. (laughs) And that's not what Jesus says. Instead, he goes, and I think Jesus said with a broken heart, and I'm adding that part myself, but I think that it was with a broken heart. Jesus said, Peter, why did you doubt? And I think it broke his heart because first Peter wanted to come. Jesus then commanded him to come, and then Peter doubted him. And I don't think Jesus thought it was funny. I think he was brokenhearted. I, I'm certain of it. I guess it's not, I don't just think it. I, I'm certain of it. I'm certain that Jesus was like, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I told you to come. Why did you doubt? And, and those are the things that we should expect where we should have gotten a pass. And there's no pass. So if there's no pass in the face of certain death, there's no pass, there's no pass, in the face of something that's absolutely impossible, walking on water, there is no pass for us when we're in the middle of our huge trial. We don't get to doubt him. It's not allowed. So we have to stop doing it. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. We have his word and we have each other. And and we can can overcome these these temptations to doubt. You're going to get tempted. There's no way around that. You'll be tempted to doubt his goodness. You'll be tempted to doubt his faithfulness, his power. There's no way around that, but you don't have to give into it. And we need to stop allowing it in our lives and we need to help each other to, to, to fight it. The two examples that I wanted to show you how God is gonna glorify himself in our trials are these. It's John 9. Would you turn there with me? Because this is what I, what I had said earlier about how God will design a trial. He'll actually design it and he'll put it in your life for his glory. And that is a crazy concept. And if you really hate that concept, 
then you have to take a moment and look at what's going on because who's really in charge? Who's really getting all the glory? Is it you or is it God? So John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. Nine, John 9, 1 through 3, it says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. So life, I imagine, I'm not blind, I never was blind, but life as a blind person, I imagine, is very difficult. Life as a blind person in the first century, I think, was very, very much more difficult. And this guy was born blind. And he's a grown man by this point. He's a grown-up. And Jesus comes along. This guy has experienced a very difficult life. He's experienced a very long trial. You guys, he was a beggar because... He was blind. He, he had to depend on the charity of other people for his survival. This is a difficult life. When the disciples come upon him and they're like, well, what happened with this guy? Why was he born blind? Did he sin? What do you mean, did he sin? Like when he was a baby in his, inf- in his mother's womb, did he sin? Or was it his parents? And Jesus said, no, it's none of that. It's so that the works of God would be declared. It's so that I would heal him and everybody would glorify me. Now, That's the connection. That was a God-designed trial so that Jesus would be glorified. There's there's another one, and it's even more of a strong, uh, where you can see it without a question, because that that one, you might be like, I don't know, but look look at the next one, John chapter 11. Jesus' friend Lazarus. We'll read John 11, 1 through 4. John 11, 1 through 4. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness, look at this, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Lazarus was a personal friend of Jesus. He he was an actual friend of Jesus. That's a really good friend to have. I mean, that's so when when Lazarus was sick and and his his sisters sent to to Jesus, come and heal him, we don't see that Jesus instantly healed him from the sickness. Instead, what we see is Lazarus dies. And four days later, Jesus comes and, and he raises Lazarus from the grave. Why? So that Jesus would be glorified. Lazarus had to suffer, and then he had to die. For what reason? For Jesus to be glorified. We can't put ourselves in the, in the position of, of getting the glory ever. Um, I, you know, being back in the States, it's exciting because I get to share with everybody what God's doing, and it's a really exciting time for us. God's moving and ministry's happening. And so I'm, and I'm, I'm thinking about it as I'm talking to people, and I, and I started to tell people, you know what, because God's doing a lot of cool stuff with us, and I, I would tell people, all I contributed to this was I just haven't quit yet. Me and my wife, we just haven't quit, and I started telling people that. Like, it, all I did was just not quit, and then God's like, really? Is that what you did? And I'm like, what? And, and God's like, I sustained you. You don't get that. And I'm like, oh, I get nothing. I only didn't quit because God gave me the grace to not quit. That's the only reason I didn't quit. That's the only reason we're still there and being used. I was like, God, can I have like just 1% of the glory, please? Just one little thing. And God's like, no, you get none. And trust me, it's not good for you. You you don't get it. I get all the glory, all of it. That's how it must be. I'm God, you're not. And I'm like, okay. Okay. I didn't do anything. I, I didn't even not quit. <laughs> so understanding, back to Hebrews chapter 10, understanding that God, he will not just allow trials, but he'll design trials. And, and, you, and the reason that I am okay telling you that, guys, is because all the time that I've spent is telling you that we're not allowed to doubt God's goodness. 
and his power and his faithfulness. We can't do it because he is good. He's power. He's faithful. Then I can tell you that, yeah, God does design trials. And he puts them in our lives in order to glorify him. If I just said that, man, we would be like, what? That's crazy. But we know he's good because we've seen what he's done for us. We've, we are able to approach him. We're able to draw near to him because of the work that Christ did for us. So understanding that God will allow these trials, it's going it, to, that, that it's also for his glory first and foremost, and it can never be second. The trial's always for his glory first. It's not for your glory first. It's not even for your sanctification first. It's for his glory first, always. That'll help you. That'll help you to endure the trial. That'll help you when you're in the middle of it to be like, okay, God's going to use this for his glory. That's good. I want to be used for his glory. And then it'll help us to, to know that God's going to use me to further his kingdom now too. And it says there uh, in verse 23, the second half, why can we be so sure about this? Why can we be so unwavering in our faith? Because he who promised is faithful. That's why. He's faithful. And this is one of the things that we can come alongside one another within the body. We can come alongside each other and we can remind each other. When you're in the middle of that trial, I can come alongside and remind you, God's faithful, he's good. And I can do it the right way. I don't have to, you know, I'm not gonna come in like this. We do it in the right way. That's, that's one of the major tools we have. That's one of the responsibilities we have as the church with, e with each other. To stir each other up. And that word that, that he uses to provoke each other. It's like, I'm going to poke you to go do love and good works, to stir each other up, to like shake you into doing good things for the kingdom of God, to go and share the gospel with people, to go and do these good things. God wants to use this to further his kingdom. And all the more so as we see the day approaching. Like, first of all, you don't know if you have tomorrow. You don't know if the people around you have tomorrow. You don't know that. So if you're afraid of sharing the gospel with them because you're afraid that they're going to think you're crazy or something, well, I guess I would say the same thing that God was asking me. Are you willing to sacrifice that? Are you willing to kind of sacrifice your reputation in a little bit in order for God to be used? For you to go to your friend or your neighbor or your family member or whoever in order to explain the full gospel to them? 